Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Laura and this is Culture Nonsense. And today we are finally talking about an actual cult. Uh, before we begin, reminder to like this video if you like it, subscribe to the channel if you'd like more of this content, and leave a comment if you have any questions, comments, or requests for videos for the future. So what we're talking about today is the Fellowship of Friends which is a kind of, I would say in the grand scheme of things, smaller cult that I hadn't really heard of before. But, you know, every once in a while, I periodically go to Spotify to look for podcasts and I just type cult <laughs> into the search bar. And there is a pretty recent podcast coming out about the Fellowship of Friends. And it's by Jennings Brown, who did a podcast a couple years ago about this guru teal swan who also had you know some some ethical issues surrounding her teachings so this podcast is called revelations and like i said it's about the fellowship of friends and i'm assuming it's called revelations because it's kind of a play on revelations the last chapter of the bible and part of the fellowship of friends is the doomsday aspect to it the leader has made many predictions in the past about the end of the world. Seems about once a decade to me there's going to be some type of event that spells doom, but everyone in the cult will be safe if they're like in the compound Apollo. Which, fun fact, once I started hearing about this cult, very odd because the headquarters of the cult is a pretty short drive <laughs> away from where I grew up as a kid. So I was like, well, now I definitely need to know more. <laughs> I'm going to do a relatively quick overview of things. I might make a part two of this video because the podcast that I've been listening to as one of the sources for this is still coming out. There's a new episode every Sunday. So if there's more information that comes to light that I'd like to speak on, I'll probably do a part two. And there's something else that I've been working on that has yet to show up in the mail that would also be really great for a part two. So if I don't get to everything in this video, rest assured there will be more. Anyway, the Fellowship of Friends was created in 1970 by Robert Earl Burton. And he was born in 1939 and was originally an elementary school teacher. So I guess you could say that in some aspects he's had, um, you know, a little bit of experience being a teacher, although elementary school teacher is very different than his type of guru, life coach, prophet side of teaching. So he came across some books written by these other philosophers and he ascribes to the fourth way, which is a type of philosophy to kind of increase your awareness to become a more enlightened being. And of course he believes that he's the most enlightened being. And like most cults, he is the charismatic leader who everyone in this organization basically defers to and he tells them how to run their lives. Now, the thing about this cult that I find most interesting is one of the ways that you become a more enlightened being is basically by exposing yourself to art and culture. He has these 44 angels who are pretty much like people you should look up to throughout history who might impart some wisdom and if you kind of ruminate on them, you might become more enlightened. And this is everyone from Marcus Aurelius, Jesus, Abraham Lincoln. Elizabeth I is the only woman, which is kind of telling, one out of 44. There's definitely some other things about this group that spell out a lot of misogyny. Um, but yes, so the more complete list of these 44 angels also includes um, artists and musicians like Bach and Vivaldi and Leonardo da Vinci, I think. So there's a huge emphasis on art and culture, pretty much specifically European culture in this cult. And the way that Robert Earl Burton wants to kind of manifest this to have his students become more enlightened is by everyone moving to this compound, which is called Apollo. And I'll put some pictures up of it over here. It is very lush. There are a lot of palm trees. There's sculptures. There's camels wandering around. I think he has some other exotic animals there too. 
So there's big art pieces. It looks very aesthetically pleasing. It looks kind of like an oasis in the middle of this area of California where there's not too much built up. So very interesting there. And then the fellowship, I'm not sure how many members there are at this point. Uh, at one point, there were a couple thousand who were spread out across the world and about 500 pretty devoted people lived at the Apollo compound. I think it's a bit less now. You know, it, it's been around for 50 years. So uh, representation has kind of gone up and down over the decades. So at this point, it doesn't sound too bad to go live in a place where you're really just supposed to be surrounded by art and beauty. Once you go to Apollo, a lot of the people there work. So the other part, besides surrounding yourself with art and beauty, the way you become enlightened is through hard suffering. So in the late 70s, Robert decided to um, have his members build a winery. So, and on the side of a mountain too. So this was a huge task. I think it's about 375 acres. And so they planted all of the vines and like made the trellises up the side of mountains, and they were actually kind of on the forefront of wineries in California. So they were kind of caught up in the wine boom, and apparently they actually make very good wine. <laughs> so the winery stopped production in 2015, but because they were relatively obscure and they produced so much, they have thousands and thousands of bottles just kind of stockpiled that they're still selling. However, even though you can buy one of these, I would encourage you not to go and buy it from this cult because you'll probably see why you shouldn't be really supporting them with your money as this video goes on. So anyway, besides spending hours a day building and then eventually running or contributing to this winery, other people in this cult were given different roles that they should do or hobbies that they should pursue by Robert. So this could be, you know, learning a musical instrument, being in a choir. So eventually everyone who lived there participated in these musical shows, even put on operas, plays, different types of theater productions, which again, I mean, doesn't sound too bad, just working at a winery all day and then practicing your instrument at night and then living among friends and putting on big community productions, basically, of art pieces. However, the control went much, much deeper than that. Robert, um, as you can see from pictures like this, and this, and this, and this, and this, um, really liked his clothing. And a lot of his lavish spending, including the building of Apollo and the buying of the camels and all of this stuff, was financed by members of the group. So like a lot of religions, they were required to tithe to the Fellowship of Friends, 10%. Uh, and this was a, a very strict rule. So if you didn't tithe, you could you know, be thrown out. So at one point, it was estimated at some point in the 90s, uh, that the fellowship made about $25 million a year, I believe, from all of its members tithing. So Robert was pretty much able to use that money at his discretion, and he spent a lot of his time off in Europe buying antiques or more clothing and stuff like that. Additionally, if you lived at the compound, uh, you might have your name changed, which is definitely a behavioral control tactic by cults. Robert liked everything to be more anglicized, so if your name sounded too exotic for him, he might change it to an English-sounding name. Uh, you know, you were told what to wear. Women, for example, um, you know, had to wear skirts or more feminine clothing. He did not approve of homosexuality, which is pretty ironic, as we might see later. Uh, additionally, you were not allowed to have sex before you were married, and if you did this the first time, you had to pay a fine of $1,500, and any subsequent uh, infraction would result in you being expelled from the group. Uh, and then this is a little bit disturbing as well. He also really didn't want some members to have children, or he decided it wasn't time for them to have children. So. There were definitely times when he forced women to have abortions and uh, 
there there are many accounts of, of women who did this who felt like they were coerced and, and wanted their children and, and didn't want to have to go through with that, which is very, very sad. And this kind of brings us into the darker side of Robert's control over his subjects. So over numerous decades, there have been dozens of reports from men who were inside the Fellowship of Friends that they were sexually assaulted by Robert. He would either claim that he was an angel or a goddess in a man's body. And once he had these members, you know, living at Apollo and instilled more and more control over them, and they believed that he was the ultimate authority, he would take advantage of these men. And it was a lot, um, as young, I believe, as 17. And uh, many men have come forward about this abuse and how it really devastated them, obviously. And so this is one of the reasons why this kind of kooky, artistic cult really had um, negative and detrimental effects on many, many people because of not only the sexual abuse, but also the psychological abuse of being in an atmosphere where this one man dictates your ultimate reality. Like I said, this cult is also a doomsday cult, so members believe that the world is going to end at some point, the only place that they are safe is Apollo, and of course Robert is the one who has all of these visions about the end of the world. And something that's pretty interesting that Jennings Brown talked about in his podcast is that in these types of doomsday cults, if a leader predicts the end of the world and it doesn't happen, we might think that people would say, okay, well, the thing my leader predicted isn't true, and so therefore I'm not going to believe him anymore. In actuality, the opposite happens. A lot of the time, if the prediction doesn't come true, the remaining people in the group, their belief in the leader is only strengthened. And this is one of those interesting psychological effects that happens when people are in cults. Another weird aspect of control that Robert had over this group is that he would kind of update these mandates and have uh, written things that he would send out to the followers to kind of update certain rules. And sometimes he changed it so that people couldn't say certain words in language like I. So you had to refer to yourself as it or just take the I out altogether. At one point you couldn't say things. I believe words like really and high were also not permitted at one point. And so this is just yet another way of behavior control and even, you know, thought control at some points. If you're taking yourself, your person out of the way you speak, it kind of dehumanizes you as well. Like I said, I believe this cult has been in relative obscurity, unless I've just missed something and never heard of them. They're not super huge, and Robert is over 80 years old now, so it will be really interesting to see what happens when he passes away, because this cult is so based on him as the central figure. I mean, we've seen with examples like Scientology how someone can very easily take over after the death of a leader. So it will be interesting to see what happens with the Fellowship of Friends, whether it kind of dissolves or if someone else picks up the mantle and carries on the work of Robert Burton. Either way, he's done some very terrible things in his past, and I believe he hasn't really be been held accountable for them because of, you know, certain statutes of limitation or people not coming forward or people not pressing charges and being shamed into kind of just living with this secret burden of abuse. So even though, like I said at the beginning, this can seem kind of lighthearted or fun, there are some real dark tendencies to this group. And it's definitely a group that should be looked at with a ton of scrutiny. And I believe more people will know about it based on the popularity of the Jennings Brown podcast and more people talking about it because of more media attention and focus. So I guess we'll see what happens in the future. Like I said, there are a couple things I didn't mention, so I'll probably do a part two on the Fellowship of Friends. So if you have any questions before that part two video, feel free to leave them in the comments below. That's going to be it for today. Thank you so much for watching this video. And remember, subscribe to the channel if you would like more of this type of content. Once again, I'm Laura. Hope everyone has a great day and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.